I'm Master Chief Mark Hakala. I spent 30 years in the Navy, but I've spent my whole life being intrigued by naval customs, traditions, history, heritage, and uniforms. So I'd like to share some of that enthusiasm with you using some items in my personal collection to get us started. Let's see what's in the sea chest today. Over the last two and a half centuries, the United States Navy sailors have worn a vast array of different kinds of headgear. Some of the styles have been inspired by fashion of the particular day. Some have been inspired by tradition. Other styles have been created for protective purposes. So we're going to jump into the sea chest and take a look at a range of headgear that can only be described as silly hats. Before we launch in, let's take a look at some definitions here. Most folks use several different words that describe different kinds of headgear interchangeably, but there really is a difference. A hat is a head covering that has a brim going entirely around the headgear. A cap is a piece of headgear that does not have a brim. It might have a visor, that bill that comes out in front to shade the eyes from the sun. A helmet usually encircles the whole skull. It's there for protection, but not just from weapons. It could be from heat and cold. The term cover, as used by the Navy Marine Corps, indicates any kind of headgear. Now, the use of this term might stem from the French when they took off their hats to be able to honor somebody of high rank, they would call it découvert, or uncovered. So, following this line of logic, in order to be uncovered, you had to remove your cover. But to apply that to a piece of headgear that already has a name as a formal title is really not correct. So, for example, chiefs and officers wear a combination cap, not a combination cover. So now that we have our nomenclature squared away, let's go ahead and take a look at some hats, caps, and helmets. One of the oldest and most continuously used pieces of headgear is the watch cap. It was introduced in Uniform Regulations of 1886, although there are references to knit caps of various kinds being issued all the way back to the earliest days of the Navy. Newer models use a double layer of wool, but traditionally it had just been a single layer. So if you look at this example from World War II, if you look at the very edge, the very edge of the bottom of the watch cap, you can see it has a distinctive weave to it. The watch cap could be prescribed for any uniform for any purpose, including, if you look at this example, sailors formed as a color guard just inside the gate of Arlington National Cemetery. Although there's a modern-day equivalent to it, the pattern of the blue cap worn by officers and chief petty officers of this style was used between 1886 and 1922. At that time, after World War I, the crown of the cap would get larger and ultimately different color covers would be introduced to be worn with the cap. As these parts were removable and exchangeable, this became the combination cap. This is the overseas cap from World War I. Navy personnel serving with the Marines in France in 1917 and 1918, they'd go over wearing a campaign hat, a Montana peak. Once in France, though, the Americans adopted this overseas cap that the British were wearing. Now, this is the father of the future garrison caps that would come in different shapes and styles throughout the coming decades. And if you stop and look at it, the design looks a little bit bizarre when you get right down to it but there's a reason for it. The sides of the cap could actually be pulled down over the ears to give extra protection in cold weather. So now, all of a sudden, the design makes a little bit more sense. The proper name of this particular piece of headgear is the blue cap. 
it was much more commonly referred to as the flat hat or even the Donald Duck hat. But again, we can see that this does not have a brim, so technically it's not a hat. Although there had been flat caps with a large circular crown going back to pre-Civil War days, this style was in use from 1941 till 1963 when it was eliminated from the sea bag. The garrison cap. This grew out of the overseas cap from World War I. And originally in the Navy, it could only be worn by pilots, officer, or chief. And yes, we used to have enlisted pilots. In 1943, the Navy made a change so that every chief and every officer could wear this particular kind of garrison cap. This is most likely because it took less resources to make a garrison cap than it did a combination cap. When the Navy introduced the garrison cap to the chiefs and officers, it was in multiple colors, one for each kind of uniform. So they actually had it in khaki. There was a gray uniform in use at the time. They made it in gray. They made it for wear with service dress blue. And they made it for wear with service dress white. This is one of mine, and I always liked this cap. This is a photo I found of me wearing the cap a number of years ago. And in case you're interested, what you're seeing in the background there is the tomb of Commodore Matthew C. Perry in Newport, Rhode Island. In 1944, the Navy introduced a new working uniform for women in the Navy, the Waves. This uniform was made of a gray and white seersucker material. And this uniform could be worn with either a combination cap or a garrison cap. This particular style of garrison cap is a little bit different from the males. It's lower crowned. It arcs down further along the back of the head, but it's still the same basic pattern. This uniform would be around into the 1950s. Here we see the eight-point olive drab utility cap made out of cotton sateen. Although the basic design goes back to the 1944 Marine Corps utility cap, sateen wasn't adopted as the material for their uniforms until 1958. Sailors serving with the Marines would wear this, but in the 1960s, other groups of Navy personnel would start wearing it. These personnel are obviously working with Navy SEALs. A new summer uniform was introduced for women in 1959. This was made of a light blue and white material, consisting of a short sleeve jacket and a skirt. It could be worn with a combination cap, but there was also a garrison cap of the exact same pattern as the old gray seersucker. In 1959, a new cap was introduced to be worn with the dungaree working uniform. Caps roughly the shape of a baseball style cap made their appearance in World War II, but this design's a little bit different. Actual baseball caps were assembled in a pattern of wedges to make the crown. And you can see that this 1959 pattern is definitely a little bit different from that. This example of mine was made in 1968. This style cap would continue to be used into the 1970s. The next style of issue utility cap was introduced in the mid to late 1970s. At that time, there was a popular TV show called SWAT, Special Weapons and Tactics, based on the LAPD unit. And the interesting thing was, the gear they wore included this Navy utility cap. So, for some time anyway, people referred to them as SWAT caps. Now, when I got to boot camp in 1981, I was issued a utility cap that actually was shaped like a baseball cap. I said, I don't want that, I want a SWAT cap. So at the first opportunity when we were permitted to go to the exchange, the first thing I bought was a SWAT cap. From 1973 to 1980, the Navy made a big mistake, and they put everybody, first class petty officer and below, into the same suit and tie uniform as chiefs and officers. They did this without thinking about how ships' berthing spaces were designed, 
and they didn't bother to consider how nasty a suit coat and a combination cap would look after they had come out of being squished inside of an individual sailor's locker. After utility caps were introduced, the Navy eventually authorized having embroidery of the ship's name and hull number. And this was usually on caps that were shaped more closely like a traditional baseball cap. Over time, various commands took some liberties with insignia, coats of arms, font, size, and style. And you wind up with a uniform item that is in no way uniform. Some of you might look closely and see that a number of the commands represented in this photo are no longer in existence. I'm sorry, I have to make an editorial comment on this one. With this design, the Navy just phoned it in. They didn't even try. I mean, they could have had the words United States Navy in an arc, just like typical ship's ball caps. They could have had the traditional eagle with upstretched wings perched on an anchor with rays coming out from above it. But no, they simply chose to put Navy. It reminds me of the movie Hot Shots with Charlie Sheen, where all the planes said, The Navy. Now, here is an eight-point cap that might look a little unusual to some of you. In the early 2000s, the Navy established Task Force Uniform. This project was headed by CNO Director Command Master Chief Rob Carroll, who still works in the Navy Uniform Matters Office to this day. Its purpose was to replace a number of different uniforms, consolidate, get rid of ones that we didn't need. But one of the main things that they were trying to do was establish a Navy working uniform. So for this, they did a wear test where select people around the fleet wore two different styles. One was a digital pattern, which we just got rid of. The other was based on the woodland camouflage pattern that had been around since the early 1980s, but the pattern was made with blues and grays. The purpose for having gray in there was so that if a sailor brushed up against some fresh gray paint, it would be hidden on the uniform and he or she wouldn't have to throw it out. The M1917A1 helmet was essentially the same style that was being used during the First World War. This pattern continued to be used by the Navy into the first year or so of World War II when the new style helmet was available. The M1 steel helmet pattern of 1941 became the helmet that the U.S. Navy would ultimately go to in World War II. It had a much better design to be able to protect the head from multiple angles. And its look was distinctly American. In addition to this helmet would be a camouflage helmet cover that also had a mosquito net built into it. Now, Marines had a standard camouflage helmet cover that sailors serving with them would be wearing. But this one was made so that it had the camouflage, but also it had a mesh net that could come down to protect one from getting bitten by mosquitoes. You can see the band going around at the base of the helmet. And if you know to look for that, you can actually see this particular item being worn in various battles in the Pacific during World War II. Some people over the years have theorized that this was a sniper's helmet. Nope, but it's not. It's strictly for protection from mosquitoes. In Navy Uniform Regulations of 1941, a tropical helmet was introduced. This was made of lightweight pressed fiber with a cotton cover. The inspiration for this was British pith helmets that would often include a zigzag turban-like band going around the base called a puggery. In this helmet, you can see that the puggery is stamped in. The original one that was introduced in 1941 was white, but in 1943 and 44, the Navy ordered large quantities of these in both khaki and olive drab. And the thing is, the olive drab one really looks a lot more gray to me. I have two different examples, and they both look more gray than green. 
These were predominantly issued to Seabees and to personnel serving in advanced bases in the Pacific. In 1942, the Navy introduced one of the silliest hats ever in its history, the Mark II Talker Helmet. This was a protective helmet meant to take care of personnel who were sound-powered telephone talkers, who were stationed around different parts of the ship to keep the command informed of what was happening. Now, oftentimes during World War II, the photographs would show one of these sound-powered phone talkers at an anti-aircraft gun mount. So every once in a while you might see on eBay somebody listing one of these as a Navy gunner's helmet. This 1942 pattern was around for decades until the Navy decided to create something even sillier looking. Going back to our nomenclature, we know that a helmet is a piece of headgear that for the most part surrounds the cranium. But I think most people think of a helmet as being protective against concussion, shock, weapons, something like that. Well, here we see a winter cloth helmet. It's cotton on the outside, it's lined with wool on the inside, and it actually had a wool face piece attachment to cover the face. So sailors standing watch on the deck of a ship in the North Atlantic would be protected from the elements. And you can see that it has a cloth extension to extend down and protect the neck. Here is yet another item that most of us wouldn't think to call a helmet, but it was. This, most of us would call a ski mask. A more proper name is probably a balaclava. But this N2 winter helmet was knitted wool to be able to cover the head, the face, and the neck. An update to the 1943-style Blue Winter Helmet, the N1, was introduced in 1945. This included a whole redesign, actually. Probably the most significant design change, other than changing the color from blue to olive drab, was the introduction of a visor to try to keep some rain and snow out of a sailor's face. Definitely one of the silliest looking of silly Navy hats is the HGU-24 flight deck helmet, commonly known as a cranial. This is composed of several pieces, a cloth helmet that goes around the head, and attached to it are a couple of different things. A couple of protective plates, but also Mickey Mouse ears, ear protection. The colors of the protective plates indicate the job responsibilities of the particular sailor on the flight deck. For example, purple is fuels, red is ordnance, and people that are wearing yellow, well, they're telling you, the pilot, what to do. This helmet dates back to World War II, but at that time, it was simply in the colors to indicate to the pilots what your job was on the flight deck. It didn't have any protective plates or anything else, nor did it have any hearing protection. Check back soon for more content. Thanks for watching.